Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. It's been a while, welcome to 2023. That is the first stream of the year. Very exciting. I have lots of different questions that I've gathered from comments and emails. And I just thought it would be great just to jump in on here and answer some questions. And if you are in chat, say hi and uh, share your questions. I will be looking into chat, kind of checking in what you have here and we can jump in. I actually have received an email on this topic and I thought, I think that it will be a pretty good maybe start um, for our stream. So this question that I see here is, why is it companies don't want to hire new Scrum Masters with no experience? This is a great question. Well, it's the beginning of the year. I'm sure lots of people are kind of starting the year with uh, new ideas, new goals, and I think getting into the Scrum industry can be one of those goals, maybe something that you've been looking at in the previous year, and now you're kind of going all in. So that's a good time to kind of get started. Go into that question. Why do companies don't want to hire new Scrum Masters with no experience? It's a good question. Well, I think um, a lot of times there are quite a lot of expectations uh, from Scrum Masters when it comes to, to the role itself, right? Because you're coming into the organization and you will need to immediately start working, right? People are, our companies are looking for people who are able to jump in and tell them how to get better, how to improve, how to implement Agile and Scrum. And if you don't have that experience, then I think there is that fear that you actually will need much more handholding than you help in the organization, especially when I believe the company is struggling and they're looking for someone who has the experience and knows how to approach the problems, right? So that is one of the fears generally that I think kind of answers to that. And that is why I think that that lack of experience is definitely something that is not really helping you if you're looking for a job, you're switching to the Scrum Master role. And that is why when I'm talking about that and talking about switching into the Scrum Master role, generally I talk about looking for some experience opportunities. You might be working right now in your company in a different role, and it is important to start getting some of that experience internally. That is how I switched in, into the Scrum Master role when I was a content manager and I looked for opportunities. How can I become a Scrum Master? And the same, I, I passed my exam, uh, I had my PSN1 and I was applying for even internal jobs in, for Scrum Master jobs in my company and I wasn't really passing through the interviews. And so instead of kind of trying to get into the industry that way, what I did is found opportunities to earn Scrum Master experience within my role that I had, right? So I was working with my team, I was working with my manager, kind of showing the benefits of the Scrum Master, what I learned and how I can help the team and took on that a lot of Scrum Master responsibilities that was my first experience and that would help me then to pro progress in this career. And I think that's what you should be focusing on is looking for those opportunities to get the Scrum Master experience. Because yes, you're right, um, no experience. And I can see why companies would be wary of that. Another thing that actually just came to mind is that a lot of times, at least when I was interviewing lots of candidates, I would have people with lots of experience. They, if you look at their resume, they have six or eight years of experience, more years of experience in, as a Scrum Master than me. But then I start interviewing them and I immediately, immediately can see that they actually do not have the knowledge or the skills that I would like them to have in the Scrum Master role. And so for me, that was a big red flag. And now if you're imagining someone coming in with no experience, then you're even thinking, okay, well, 
if people with experience don't really know what it is now imagine people with no experience so there is this i think disconnect as well and um, that is why it's so important to be very on point with your knowledge and as well as looking for for an you need to have an understanding of how to apply all of this theory that you have learned in real situation right how do you facilitate a daily scrum do you attend a daily scrum how do you facilitate a retrospective what do people do in sprint reviews right all of those things and i think being able to answer those questions is definitely what generally the hiring managers are looking for so ahmed you have a question of how can we you speak about agile clinic and how to run an agile clinic effectively i assume you mean a community of practice like an agile community of practice in a company because the other interpretation i can think of is kind of like an agile assessment so i'm not sure which one it is if you can put in some of the information to help me with that okay so just to kind of follow up on what i started to to talk about on i see dima you have another question there how do you fix lack of experience so i talked about that a little bit do you suggest starting with some other position within the company you want to work in as a scrum master i think it may be a good way kind of good entry point if you have maybe other type of experience already and you're going in to a company that you know is implementing Scrum and Agile, and you see potentially future opportunity. If you are part of the team, for example, that is Scrum team, and then eventually you can start taking on the responsibilities of a Scrum master, helping out, maybe shadow other Scrum masters, and that can be the way how you um, you can go into that role. I th- I think that this is kind of an easier way but it's a longer one right okay wait let me let me go back to the questions it's usually i have so many questions let's go in order so we have vara who asks hi can you help explain on um how to apply agile and scrum practices for plastic device development example like a syringe hmm interesting well, a question for here would be, is it an innovative device? Is it something that you are creating from, from scratch in terms of you are creating something that has never existed before? Or are you recreating a product like a standard product, a standard syringe? And you're just kind of going through the regular procedures of how to uh, make a syringe and there is not a lot of that innovation there because depending on what you're building, what kind of product you're building, you might want to use Scrum or maybe not use Scrum, right? Scrum doesn't apply just to everything. Uh, When we apply in Scrum, we are looking at products that have a lot of complexity. So innovative products, right? Something that didn't exist before. Software development in general is complex. So that's why Scrum works there. So um, a product that has a lot of a lot of factors, external factors that might impact its success. Um, like you do not really know what customers really want or need the technology to use in order to create this product might be changing regularly or the technology is complex enough that there isn't just one best solution and you always need to review and adapt to the situation and to the customer needs, then you would want to use Scrum. If you are recreating a product that already exists, then you would you you don't need Scrum, right? You can apply the traditional project management tools, uh, like construction doesn't need Scrum. They use Waterfall and it works. So don't break, uh, you know, don't recreate the wheel. Um, And I think that's kind of where you first need to understand which environment you live in. And if you want to learn more, look into, I'm going to put it into chat, is Stacy Complexity Matrix. Complexity, that's one. And another one is Kunivin Framework. So these are the two things that I would recommend looking into. Kunivin framework, Stacey complexity map to help you first understand. 
Now, VAR, I see that you're saying from scratch, so something innovative, something new, it didn't exist before. Well, because it's a physical product, you might not be able to immediately create a physical product or a physical representation of that product, but you still need to go through certain stages of approvals and uh, before you can actually create it. So what you can use instead is prototyping, right? Actually, the value you will be delivering at a sprint is a prototype, something that we can show to our stakeholders and customers in order to get their feedback. That's the whole point, right? We want to show something tangible, something real, and get the feedback from our stakeholders and customers. So prototyping can be the right way to go, right? And then as you progress, you can look into the, um, for example, if you have a prototype of how, what the design is going to be, right? And you have a general idea of how to, you wanted to create, then you might need to make some decisions around um, maybe materials that you're going to use. And I think there will be a lot of that prototyping and research involved before you can actually start creating the real physical thing. So you're going in the same way. And the most important question to always ask is how can we deliver something working or usable so that our customers and stakeholders are able to provide real feedback of what they think? Not something that is written down in a document and they read it and said, looks good, right? But actually something as real as possible and going through those steps, I think. Okay, so I asked, answered this one. Another one from Dima that Scrum provide flexibility for people who also work in arts. Let's say I'm an actor. Would it be a good daily job to escape from time to time for shoots? I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, art, if we're talking about creating, well, actor, you're an actor, you're creating, uh, the product that you're creating is a movie, for example, or maybe a theater, something either, either or. Is Scrum something that can be applied there? Potentially, right? Because you can split in the work into smaller pieces, right? And maybe you are kind of trying out the same, you're trying out a pilot. Think of uh, how the, um, the series are created, right? You would have a pilot once you are kind of releasing it and you are getting some feedback on that pilot and then you're using that feedback to create the next, the next episodes or the next seasons. And that would be kind of that agile way of looking at things. But I'm not sure if your question is kind of more specific uh, to the acting role, because I feel like, let's say I'm an actor, would it be a good daily job to escape to from time to time for shoots? Not sure that I just, uh, but again, giving you some more uh, ideas or examples that would be helpful. Okay, Therese has another question. My crew has a lot of carryovers to the next sprint because of issues constantly coming into the sprint. How do you handle this? So you're saying you're very new to this crew, to this team, right? How new are you? Is it a couple of weeks, couple of months, right? First, you want to figure out what's going on, really just to analyze the situation. Now, in terms of the carryovers, I do have a video on carryovers if you want to kind of go into more detail. So I recommend going, watching this one. But generally, if you have a lot of carryover that kind of always go into the same sprint because you have a lot of interruptions that are happening in the sprint, I think the first thing to do is to address the interruptions. Where are they coming from, right? Are we getting some major bugs that are coming our way? And that's why we have to absolutely have to switch and start working on something else? Or is it just people coming into your team crew space and they're telling the team, no, I want you to work on this. Everybody drops whatever they're working on and start working on this new thing. Is it this kind of interruption, right? So it's more about trying to figure out where is it coming from first. Now, if the interruptions that are coming in to your team are not uh, not like major issues that must be resolved ASAP, 
the kind of production issues. If it's not that, then you need to be more strict around the boundaries of Scrum. If the team started their sprint, they have a specific sprint goal, they have planned their sprint in order to achieve that sprint goal, and anything new come in their way, well, great. It goes into the product backlog, and we're going to review it and consider it for the next sprint. So that is the first rule to set up to just say, hey, we are using Scrum. In Scrum, we need to have enough focus, but we are open for to new suggestions. It's just we won't be taking them today immediately. We will prioritize them for the next sprints based on other priorities that we have. Um, if this is more in terms of big major issues coming your way, well, maybe not production issues, but say major bugs uh, that have to be resolved soon, then I would ask the question, how come the team is at this point that they have so many bugs in their system that they constantly need to, to stop to fix those, right? And instead of trying to organize around the problem is to first understand the underlying reason for that happening. Is it because we are maybe not doing enough testing? And so when we're releasing our product, then we tend to have lots of major bugs that appear in our, in, in our product. And then they kind of come and bite us in the ass at the end, right? Or three sprints from now. So a question to ask there, okay, how can we improve the quality of our product then to reduce that, those bugs? And so it will depend on which, what situation you're in. And I also would recommend looking into, if you say have a certain amount of support that you would need to provide to your customers, maybe there is an expectation that you are need to address certain customer requests during each sprint. Well, then plan for it. Look into how much work in general or how much time in general out of the sprint is being spent on those customer requests, like ad hoc stuff. Say it's 30%. Well, in this case, when you're planning for the sprint, you're only taking, you're only considering the 70% as your maximum capacity. You know that on average, 30% is going to go to those bugs or requests, etc. And then you don't you basically cut it out and say, we're going to put it aside. And if we don't have anything by some magic, this sprint, we don't have any new requests and we finish everything else we had in our sprint backlog, great. Well, we're going to take something new and start working on it. So it's more trying to plan a bit better for that. Another one from Dima. I know software engineers sometimes have days when they do, don't do anything. Is it the same with Scrum or not? Because it looks like Scrum is micromanaging teams. I'm correct. Well, uh, not really. <laughs> so Scrum is more about self-managing teams, not micromanaging. When you're looking at the Scrum team, uh, no one is actually anybody's manager, right? We have developers, we have Scrum Master and Product Owner. They're all on the same level. They work together, they make decisions together, and each of them might have different um, approaches or different knowledge and skills that they're bringing to, to the conversation. They have different accountabilities, but they all are there to build a great product. So no one's there is micromanaging. Now, if you have a Scrum Master who is there, checking in on everybody's status and taking in notes and reporting and then making sure that everybody has a a job for the day. I'm sorry, but that's not a Scrum Master. <laughs> that's not the role of the Scrum Master. You missed the whole point. So nor the well done Scrum reduces micromanagement and instead allows the team to figure out what they should be doing on a daily basis, right? So sometimes have days when people don't do anything. Think of it that way. Um, Scrum team, people in the Scrum team do not only need to do their traditional work or tasks. For example, software engineers need to do some coding. 
in a scrum team, you also need to do other stuff. You need to plan, you need to refine your product backlog, you potentially need to uh, do additional learning as part of your retrospective. You might have some action items that you brought into the sprint. So your work is not just coding. You have lots of other things to do. And maybe today you're not going to write any code. Maybe today you're going to uh, help a QA. Or maybe today you're going to work on that uh, documentation that we're missing, right? So there are lots of ways of how people can take on that time that they might have left to get better, prepare maybe for the next sprint, right? Or help others in their team. Okay, Mohammed is asking, do I need technical and coding background to be a Scrum master, I assume Scrum master in a company? No, I don't think so. I know that there are kind of two schools of people. Some would say you have to be a developer, you have to have technical background. I, more on the other side, I do not believe that you need to have technical background. What you do need is the understanding of the work, right? You don't need to know how to do the work, but I think it's important that you know how the work is being done, as in, what is the process? What are the general workflows people are going through? You know, I have a video on this uh, talking about the kind of the technical knowledge that Scrum Masters need, where I really talk about the fact that you don't need to have the coding background or technical background. You just need to understand the software development lifecycle, right? Or know some of that terminology. So when you hear your team speaking about those things, you know what that mean, they mean, right? Deployment, um, you know, Q, UET environment, dev environment, right? What, Q, what kind of tests might exist? What is unit testing, right? What is refactoring? Things like that. I think this is something that you need to understand. Doesn't mean that you need to know how to do it. Arca Arcadius Hopper, <laughs> not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay, I started a new job and noticed that the team is discouraged to the Scrum approach. They don't want to make a daily or other Scrum events. How can I encourage them? Well, it all comes back to, I think, figuring out why they don't want to do it, right? Uh, there might be some history that they maybe had a really bad Scrum implementation previously. You know, they had a Scrum master who was actually a micromanager you know, they were forced to implement practices that didn't make sense. That might be coming from there. So then you would need to work with them and kind of help them understand what is part of Scrum, right? And what isn't. So actually showing them that some of the things that happened previously in their, their implementation that maybe was a total disaster to show them those things are not actually Scrum. It's just you got unlucky with a manager, right? Or you got unlucky with the situation you were placed in. But it's not about Scrum. In the situation as well as they don't want to do daily Scrum, they don't want to have any other Scrum events. Well, why is that, right? We're trying to understand, do they feel that they're wasting their time? And if that is the case, then why is that? Maybe your daily scrums are taking 45 minutes and it's just a, a, a session where everybody is just talking and talking and no one cares about anything, right? What other people are working on. And that is why they don't want to do a daily scrum. Well, then your role here is to make that, help them make that daily scrum more productive, right? You want that daily scrum to be something that... Um, would be effective for them, productive for them, but also still aligned with the Scrum, well, what Scrum is. I think that some, I'd say some teaching education can be helpful. Maybe you can run a couple of sessions to talk about why Agile is important, why are we implementing it, the same with Scrum, what is Scrum, how it can help them. Right? Because Scrum is not only about helping the organization to become better and build awesome products, but it's also about creating a great working environment. Right? So teaching them that. Right? We're implementing Scrum for a reason. 
here's what we're trying to achieve. Here are the benefits that we are trying to create for you in this team. But in order to get those benefits, well, we need to work together. We need to follow some of those Scrum rules, right? Which is having the daily or other Scrum events. So I would also say kind of don't try to turn it into happy, clappy, you know, Scrum mastery stuff. <laughs> what I mean is uh, we often kind of come in, say a retrospective, or like, hey, let's do a little icebreaker. It's going to be fun. Right. And people might feel that they're just wasting their time. So you might instead focus on the small improvements that can be made with Scrum to help them, you know, to just help them on a daily basis so that they feel maybe less stressed, much more productive. Right. And looking for small things that you can implement, maybe even yourself to help your team to make their life easier and then turning them to those improvements and saying, by the way, these improvements we implemented, I implemented them because Scrum is what the inspiration for them, right? You might not tell them in advance that you're using maybe Scrum or Agile practices, but if this is something that you implement and it can help them, you can get, gain some quick wins and then show to them that it is actually something that can be very helpful for them. So hi, Daria. What are your thoughts on Scrum being used in building refurbishments and fit out projects? I have been using Scrum in property development for four years now, along with Agile PM, DSDM approach. I think that it can be applied. I'm just thinking about the example project kind of in my in my head for what it could be, right? Uh, if we are thinking about, say I'm, I'm gonna take a, maybe a house renovation project. Um, you are working on a house renovation project. I think you can use agile practices and principles to help you with that. For example, if traditionally we would say you have, you need to renovate the whole house, right? And you would try to plan everything ahead. And the first thing you're gonna do, you're gonna tear everything up so the house is unlivable, right? And then it's going to take months and months to finally start getting to usable living space, right? And then if you are applying agile principles, instead you can split it into small batches and take that agile approach saying, okay, we will start with one space first. We're not going to... Uh, basically do everything at the same time, but we're going to do small fit, small batch at a time. And then say we are doing the kitchen, we're going to finish the kitchen fully. It's going to be 100% done before we start on anything else. So that can be kind of an, a way of how you can use it. Another, um, I heard that just some simple scrum principles or rules such as having a daily scrum when you are working on that kind of project can really accelerate the work because everybody comes together every day at the same time to discuss what, are, what do you want to achieve today? Who needs help? Who needs who to come in to work on something, right? And I think that basically just creates more collaboration and can be very helpful, right? Um, I don't know if like the full Scrum is something that could be used, maybe, it's more, can you get to something fully completed, like some kind of value delivered, a working product, right? Something done within one month, right? Because in Scrum, a sprint is one month. Can you do something full and fully done within one month? And if yes, then I think you can definitely use the Scrum principles and the Scrum framework. Okay, pretty nurse babe, as a Scrum master, what is your interaction with stakeholders? Have you ever stepped in the role of the business analyst? I did not ever step, stepped in the role of the business analyst specifically. I did need to work often with the product owner a bit more closely to help them with product backlog management. Uh, the interaction with stakeholders that I usually would have 
are more on the coaching and teaching side. When you're interacting with stakeholders, your goal is to help them understand how they need to get involved with your team to help them, right? The fact that, for example, when you're running a sprint review, you want important stakeholders to be there, right? Often the interaction I would have is helping stakeholders understand that they do need to carve out some time to be in the sprint review. I would also interact with them in the sprint review, for example, by getting, by creating um, kind of understanding of that they need to provide feedback or maybe helping them to provide more valuable feedback to the team. Another way to interact with stakeholders could be when you have some tension. For example, if you have stakeholders who are constantly coming in and going back to the question that we had earlier, coming in and asking for new stuff to be done, you can interact with stakeholders at this moment to help them understand that they cannot just come in and ask teams to do something out of the blue. We have a product owner, we have a product backlog, we need to plan together. But it's once again, kind of teaching and coaching stance that you would be taking with stakeholders. Yeah, now if you are in the situation because you're asking, have you stepped into the role of the business analyst? So I assume there isn't anyone who is doing that part, kind of that part of the job. And I assume you don't really have a product owner if this is the case, or you have to get into that pro business analyst position. Uh, then I would say you may either kind of officially say, interim, I am becoming a product owner, right? Or, or you actually start looking for in the organization for who could be the better person to take on the role of the product owner. Because your role is not really just to kind of type in the information, like the requirements into the product backlog. Uh, it's really to help create the structure within which the team can be successful. And for that, you do need to have a dedicated product owner. So that might need um, kind of involve you working with stakeholders to try to define who could be playing that pro product owner role. And um uh, setting this up, like setting the processes up for that person to take on the role of the product owner. And that will involve stakeholders, right? They need to know what those processes are, what the role of the product owner is, right? How it is going to be working between the product owner, maybe product management teams, the stakeholders, and the Scrum team, right? So that would be other ways of what you might need to do or how you would interact. Arcadius, uh, you were saying, we deal with carryovers by setting one guy who is a sprint's buddy and his job is to protect the scope. So that is another way, another approach. Um, once again, it's just a practice. It's not like scrum, but it is a practice that I used as well with one of the teams more specifically. We had like a support person on rotation and that way they were protecting basically the rest of the team from all of the support stuff. They were dedicated to all of this as answer, answering all of the support questions. And then in the next sprint, we had a rotation. Someone else would take that role. So that allowed everyone to work on some new stuff like feature development uh, on the regular, but also kind of taking more of that customer centric role as well but from time to time only right if you have like one operations guys guy the whole time i think they will get bored pretty quickly <laughs> you know so having a rotation can be good capacity plan excel spreadsheet is in hours versus we are calculating the sprint sc scope in story points by looking in capacity numbers in hours, how can we project the total story points? So story points and hours uh, do not combine together. Like it's like comparing apples to oranges, basically. It's two different concepts. They have no correlation between each other. Hours are 
hours, like how much time I'm going to spend on something. Story points, we are estimating. What are we estimating with story points? We're estimating effort, how, how difficult is it to do this task. We're estimating complexity. We're estimating risk and uncertainty. Maybe we have a very simple task. We know that the effort-wise is very small, but we have a lot of risk associated with that. We're looking at it and saying, well, it's very easy that we can break something, right? Seems to be that it's easy in terms of the effort, but it might blow up in our faces because it's very risky. Or the other way around, you might be estimating something that has a very big amount of effort, but very clear, we know exactly what we need to do. So very low risk, very low uncertainty. So these are the things that we estimate with story points. These are not ours, so they do not align in any way. So kind of thinking about the, I'm just going back to your question on the Excel spreadsheet. Basically, I'd say if you need to calculate capacity in hours, you can do that. Uh, but all, if you're using also story points, just use them separately, like consider them two different metrics. Because I think that is the only way that you can really have those metrics stay still useful to you. Like hours are not equal in story points to story points in any way. Okay. So second question. Sometimes the QA tasks are um, breaking down into subtasks of user story versus sometime in some other projects, PO is creating separate stories for testing tasks, which should be the preferred way. The preferred way would be the first way. Basically, uh, testing, documentation, whatever that is, needs to be part of the work that is being done on every product backlog item. Say you're developing a, a certain functionality, you're developing it, you're coding it, you're testing it this because this is how you can deliver something that is done. These, for every sprint, we're trying to deliver a done increment, so something working, something usable. And when we're talking about software, we cannot consider it deliverable if we didn't test it. So you need to basically do all of the work within one sprint to consider something fully done. So testing tasks will be part of the same user story, if you're using user stories or the same ticket, right? Um, what kind of tasks will need to be done on each ticket will depend on the acceptance criteria of that ticket, but also on your definition of done. So if you if you don't yet have a definition of done, you need to work on that to make sure that you have a clear understanding of what done means, what basically it is. When you say that functionality or feature is done, it needs to be potentially releasable. What does it mean for your product? How much testing do you need to do? Do you need to do some documentation? It's not only about just pure implementation. So. What are the possible ways to commit sprint scope during sprint planning? Planning poker is one of them. What are other options? Mm, I mean, planning poker uses story points is kind of the easiest one to use. If you have kind of same size items in your product backlog generally, which requires a lot of good splitting, I'd say, then you can just count how many items you have. Technically, that's just a different way to calculate velocity. And then base, the, base how much work you can take into the sprint on that velocity. And then the other one can be as what, uh, how do we call it? We call it, I think, I actually don't know how it is called. Let's call it the confidence uh, type of planning. <laughs> what does it mean is, say we have a sprint goal, we set it up, and now we take the first item from our product backlog, we move it into our sprint backlog, and we ask the, the team, how confident are we that we can finish this item in the sprint? So it's the first item, probably is small enough, right? 
normally should be small enough to be completed within a sprint. So the team says, yeah, sure, 100%, no problem, no, not too concerned. Okay, great. You're taking the second item. Now you put the second item into the sprint. You ask the same question. How confident are we that we can deliver this one too? Right? And then you are kind of getting like one by one, you're adding items one by one. And then once you get to the confidence level where you put something into the sprint and you ask, how confident are we? And the team is like, hmm, well, I mean, we can do it. You can immediately hear, okay, the confidence level just dropped. Maybe we shouldn't be taking this item. Right? So again, I'm not sure if that's the right name for it, but we can call it confidence level. Uh, type planning. <laughs> Question from Maria. How shall the juniors from master start working with a mature team? Any tips? Great question. Okay. If you are new and you're coming into a team that, uh, first of all, knows Scrum, or at least thinks that they know Scrum, and has been running for a long time, the first things first, you should not come in and start changing things. I think in this situation, you will need to spend much more time on figuring out how the team works, why they implemented certain practices, why they are you know, doing things a certain way. And honestly, coming to your team and saying, hey, I'm, I'm still kind of new to this, and I see that you have your shop running well, and I want to learn from it. So... I'd like you to tell me more about how you set up this process, how is it working for you, and where do you see any potential improvement opportunities? Maybe there are some challenges or you know pain points that they see right now, but in the meantime, you are working with them, trying to really understand their way of working and learning from them, right? And I think just first of all, building that relationships with them before you jump into potential changes, right? Because you don't want, you wouldn't want someone to come in suddenly, right? Into your work environment and say, okay, so you're doing it all wrong. I'm going to change everything. Well, you just created a team full of uh, people who really don't like you. Now, you don't want to, to do it that way, even if you see some potential improvements, say you see challenges or problems, you know, don't jump in and say, okay, I'm going to tear this all down and I'm going to rebuild it. I instead try to understand and work with them, build the relationships, and then slowly start to kind of look for opportunities. Where can you be useful to the team? How can you help them? Tobias is asking... I am the first Scrum Master in a small IT company. For various reasons, Scrum by the Scrum Guide is impossible. We manage, but barely. Should I push Scrum or rather focus on general agile principles? Thanks. That's not a lot of information to go on. I obviously, the big question I have, why is that impossible? Like the Scrum by the Scrum Guide is impossible. Then why is this company implementing Scrum? Like, what was their reasoning then? What are they trying to achieve with Scrum? So maybe starting there first, before you make a decision whether the Scrum is the way to go, or you may want to look into other frameworks, or just agile principles, or maybe some engineering practices instead. I would try to figure out why they're trying to use Scrum what kind of problems they're trying to fix because they wouldn't be using it if they weren't trying to do something with it. I mean, they might be using it just because like a manager said so. Hopefully that's not the reason, but it might be. But usually say, say even if this comes from the executives, right? So executive team says, we're going to go agile, do Scrum. Good luck. So I would say they still have a reason for doing that, right? Maybe they didn't communicate it really well, but they should have a reason for doing Scrum, right? Hopefully. 
And so I think maybe start there first, figure out why they're doing it, and then fr look start from there. And maybe, yes, maybe you don't need to implement Scrum. And instead, you can focus on fixing small problems or implementing some improvements by using Agile and Scrum principles, but not necessarily uh, setting the full Scrum team. And then maybe a bit later, a couple of months, six months, maybe more, once you feel that the teams and the organizations, the organization is ready to do real Scrum, then start to implement it fully. Okay. Janet is saying, yes, we'll follow the Scrum guide. Instead of developers, they are contractors. By empowering them using Scrum framework, they're free to solve issues using empiricism and lean thinking. Great. Yeah, so Scrum is not about the process, right? It's really about creating good working environments, empowering people, letting them self-manage, setting the, the great goals for them, kind of creating the environment around the team that where they can succeed. Yes, yes, Shade. Sorry, I'm mispronouncing it. Hi, how easy it is to change career into the Scrum Master also for someone who doesn't speak much. Can that be a difficult thing for them? How difficult it is to switch careers? Well, I mean, as switching in, into any career, especially if you're coming from a different, completely different industry, right? If you are coming from a role that has some of the important skills already, like you were using teaching, coaching skills, um, generally working with people, then it might be easier. But if you're, that's the reality, right? And I think a lot of people in the comments to my videos, even here, are saying, well, it's really hard to get a job without the Scrum Master sorry, the Scrum Master experience, right? That's true. So it might take you some time. You might need to volunteer to get some experience, but that would be for free, right? So that might be a long journey. You might need to take a pay cut um, before you can actually get into fully the, that Scrum Master role. Uh, if you are within an organization, right, that has Scrum, you might have an easier way to switching into the role. And that's how I think most people switch. And that is like the easiest way to, to do it. And now for someone who doesn't speak much, will it be difficult? I think it might be like if you don't speak much because because you're shy or is it because um you don't think maybe that in certain situations you need to contribute i'm not sure what the reason is that like you don't speak much right but maybe it is something that can be developed really it's not like a scrum masters are born naturally good facilitators that's not true that's a skill that you develop. And uh, the Scrum Master also, it's not like you speak a lot unless you're facilitating something. It's more about speaking at the right moment and asking the right question, I think. But it is a, a role that kind of puts you forward a lot. Like you will need to communicate with many different levels, like people in the organization on many different levels. and. It means that you might need to step out of your comfort zone if you're not yet feeling confident doing that. So I think it's more of um, knowing that you will need to do some of that work and to develop some of those skills and get comfortable with uh, open communication and potentially speaking a little bit more. Hey, Jacques is asking, good afternoon. Is it a difficult transition from Scrum Master role to product owner? Ah, interesting question. I think it's just same, two different roles. It's not about difficult transition. Well, for example, as a Scrum Master, I had to learn a lot of product management techniques because I was helping my team, I was helping my product owner with a lot of the product related activities. So I needed to do a lot of 
the research and learning on my own anyway. For example, if you are a Scrum Master, I generally would recommend to you to go to a professional Scrum product owner class, right? Because you need to know what your product owner does. I think it will depend in a way on the product you're taking over, right? As is if it's very maybe technical product and you don't have the technical knowledge, it might be a bit difficult. It's not that the product owner has to have very deep technical understanding of the product they work on. It's more on the business level, but still it might be challenging if you don't understand that maybe technical part of the product. It's just, I think, different types of uh, skills that you need to develop, you know, and figure out, is it something that uh, makes, makes sense for you? Is it something that inspires you? Are you interested in communicating more with customers and stakeholders on the level of business requirements or setting up goals? deciding what are the most valuable features you will need to potentially do some work on the numbers right figuring out you know return on investment or um, trying to figure out what other metrics you might need to implement to help you make decisions um, for the product so it's just it's just a bit different is it a difficult transition i don't know i had to be a product owner for my business and I've always been just a scrum master. Yeah, I had to take on, uh, start to wear another hat. And I think that I made quite a few mistakes at the beginning as a product owner. But you lo- learn, right? You learn and you get better at it. If this is something that then makes you happy and inspires you, then you know that you can continue developing in, in, this, ro- in this role. So Abhishek is asking, how would you convince someone to get into Agile? Why do you want to convince them to do that? That's my favorite question, right? Why? If we're talking about, say, you are working with someone, let's consider a manager. So you're working with a team and you have a manager and the manager is like, Agile, it doesn't work. I don't want to go Agile. And you are kind of look, looking at it as a challenge or a pain point to resolve for the team, then you need to work with this manager to help them understand why Agile works and why they need to switch. I think it's, uh, in this case, you need to figure out, is it just because the person doesn't understand the Agile, right? And they, they just need a bit more information, a bit more learning why Agile can be beneficial for them. So you are trying to find the right message, the right message for them. For example, if you're talking about Agile with a Scrum team, why is Agile great for them? Well, we're going to remove micromanagement. You will be a self-managing team. We will create great team environment. You will be able to feel that you are contributing to a greater goal through your work. So those are the benefits to to the Scrum team. When you're talking to, say, an executive, a CEO, about why they should do Agile, well, why would they be interested in Agile? Well, because that will give them more flexibility and adaptability. They will be able to adapt to new market opportunities faster. They will be able to deliver more frequently to their customers, which might increase their potential revenue. Uh, it will allow them to technically in the long run in the long run to stay in business if the environment around them changes the business environment changes they will be able to adapt to that so the message is different but we are talking about the same thing agile and i think it's finding the right message why would they care why would they care to try Agile. And then one more thing that I always like to add here, you cannot coach someone into anything really if they don't want to be coached, if they don't want to change, if they're not open-minded, you that will be just a waste of time. A person needs to be open for that change, right? It's kind of the example I give that if you are looking for a therapist, for example, no therapist is going to take a patient who doesn't want to go to a therapist because they know it's going to be a waste of time. They know they won't be able to get anywhere. 
And that is exactly that. So when you are working with someone, you need to understand, are they actually coachable? Can they, can you bring them around or are they stuck and they don't want to listen? Yesha Dave, thank you for your response. Thanks for the questions. Um, I can do this as another question. Hello, please. Can you shed light on technical debt? Okay. Technical debt is a big topic. First things first, we say technical debt. It doesn't always mean technical. So there is non-technical technical debt. Let me explain. So what is technical debt? Well, it's basically deferred work, something that you should finish, should do, but right now you either consciously or unconsciously decide not to. For example, uh, you say we are building, uh, we are writing a, a book. We are writing a book, right? And we write one chapter and instead of immediately reviewing it for any spelling mistakes, we say, ah, I'll review it later. I'll continue writing instead. So that kind of is, you're accumulating that deferred work. You definitely will need to still review the whole book, but you're just putting that work to the end, basically, right? And then once you get to the end of the book and you have written everything, now you have, instead of just one chapter to review, now you need to go through your 500 pages of, uh, of the text to review it for um, spelling mistakes, right? So that is kind of that technical data is that deferred work. And usually it is happening if your definition of done is not well defined. If um, often it is related to lack of automation, sometimes uh, no time for documentation, for example, when the team or the organization make a decision to basically trade speed for quality. Or I say quality, we'll fix it later because we need to go faster. Right. Another examples of technical debt could be code comments. Those take time. So when you're coding, you need to stop and start writing down the explanations for everything. And if you are pressed for time, like I just need to finish this code, you're not going to put anything, no explanations into your, into your code. And at this moment, that's fine, right? Well, you finished your work. That's okay. You, you did it quickly. But you don't know when this technical debt is going to come back and become a problem. When will you need to go back to that file and rework on it? Well, next time you're going to come back, there is no code comments. You're going to spend five times more time on trying to figure out what's in that file, right? Um, especially if you have, say, one person who holds the knowledge, you don't do the knowledge transfer, that person leaves, and then suddenly you have a huge gap because you have created that technical debt of a no knowledge transfer, right? So that's kind of how you can look at the, this technical debt, some work that you definitely should do, but uh, you are basically trading speed for quality. So I hope that helps as quickly as I could explain. Okay, a couple of more questions for, from uh, Grigor. Hello, do you have any recommendations for beginner-friendly Scrum and Agile materials? Well, beginner-friendly, I wanted to say the Scrum Guide, but it's not very beginner-friendly. <laughs> uh, my colleagues at Agile for Humans have a, a playlist on YouTube where they talk about Scrum. This is much more kind of Scrum specific. And I think they kind of go into more like easier topics, starting kind of from the basics. It's called Scrum One-on-One -on -One, uh, in Agile for Humans on their YouTube channel. Now for Agile, more specifically, I have a, an online course that is called The Fundamentals of Agile. And there I go into details on agility, starting from values and principles. And I really decompose every of those principles and values into details and giving you some real life examples that are easy to understand to help you understand what Agile is, where it is coming from, 
and as well as how it is actually applied in real life, in which cases it should be applied, it shouldn't be applied, why, uh, not why, how do you actually apply every value and every principle in work life, right? In the teamwork, in how you manage people, how you manage projects. So if you're interested, the fundamentals of Agile is on my website. It's scrummaster.com. I will put the link, I guess, in the description of this video as well. And otherwise you can just find it on my website. Maybe I can actually give you a link uh, to the page if you want to learn more about it. And yeah, and the Scrum 101 at Agile for, for Humans, that is more Scrum specific. How much different is the project manager from the Scrum Master and why do companies try to merge the roles? Ooh, how different a lot. They just have different focuses. They need to um, use different skills. They have different accountabilities and responsibilities generally. Why do companies want to merge them? Because Scrum Master is still a pretty new role and it's difficult to understand. So what we're trying to do, what companies are trying to do is put it into a box that they already know. So Scrum Master is a new thing. I don't understand what it is, but kind of sounds like a project manager. I'm going to say it's like a project manager. I'm just going to actually hire project management managers, ask them to do project manager work, but I'm going to call them Scrum Masters. Right? This is what's happening uh, because it's just a new role. It's difficult to understand. And a lot of people have just difficulty kind of grasping the concept. Alvin, what can you advise Scrum Masters without IT experience? How much is the chance to land a Scrum Master role? I don't have any IT experience. So <laughs> I hope that answers this question. I do have a video uh, on my YouTube channel where I talk about that. I'm not sure what it's called. Maybe something like should Scrum Master be technical? So um, go look for that one. How much? there is a chance to land the Scrum Master role. As I said, I've worked with teams that work on extremely technical products. I will tell you that I have no idea the work that they were actually doing, right? I'm not there to tell them how to do their work. They are experts on that product, on the technical stuff. I'm the expert on Scrum and team building. So I don't think you need to be technical or have IT experience. Can you give two to three different conflict scenarios and how did you resolve them? Well, maybe not two to three, I'll give you one, okay? <laughs> one a real life scenario. So um, I was, it was actually happened, uh, happened to me quite early in my Scrum Master career where I had, uh, without actually knowing it, there was a conflict that was brewing within the team and it was a conflict between the tech lead our team lead and our product owner. And at some point it just exploded into our faces. There was like a screaming match happening in the open space. And I had to, first of all, kind of stop that conversation in the moment because it was becoming unproductive. It was not getting anywhere, right? If people were just getting certain to get frustrated. A lot of yelling, we're not listening. So breaking them up first, and then my approach is to first try to conduct an unbiased review of what is going on, which means as um, going and talking to each side and trying to figure out what's going on, right? I'm not here to take sides. I'm here to try to understand. The next thing is to be the mediator, bringing people together, and this is what I did. I basically, we had those conversations. I brought them together after like some time at the same day into one room. And I said, okay, so here's what I heard. Here are some frustrations from this side. Here's some frustrations from this side. Um, let's talk about um, why we are working together. And I actually started talking about the goal, right? So I said, as a team, we're still a team. We are working towards the same goal together, right? Let's recognize what this goal is. It seems that we are just had chosen different ways of approaching that. So we have the goal, you know, reminding people of that. And then just mediating that conversation where you just give 
each side a, an opportunity to talk about their frustrations um, and explain their situation and then trying to find uh, basically you're trying to find connections where they agree like you're trying to find those small things where they have the common ground and you catch on to those and you work out of those um, of those uh, common ground scenario scenarios or common ground ideas that they have and that's why I said talking about a goal can be helpful because this is basically a common ground for both sides. Uh, you can use also nonviolent communication and uh, also look into the empathy map. And I also have a video on that. <laughs> I have lots of videos. Yeah, so I have a, a video on conflict, how to resolve team conflict in the workplace. So look into this one. And favorite agile retrospective techniques. Ooh, uh, do I have a favorite? <laughs> I have uh, a favorite, which is uh, the lazy technique, which is the lean coffee. I like this one because when maybe I'm out of time, I cannot prepare. That's the one I go for. It's easy to set up and easy to facilitate. I like timeline. Timeline is a great technique, um, usually especially helpful for kind of long, longer Period of, periods of time, maybe not just one sprint. If you're maybe looking at, say, um, a release, that can be useful. So timeline is a good one. Do I have any other ones? Well, I really like the team index, or it's also called the Spotify health check, because it really gives you different topics to evaluate, and then you can bring the discussion to the most important topics that exist. For the team like the, the, that the team actually highlighted as the the worst ones right the the worst uh, situations or the worst worst areas for them and then you can focus on exactly that instead of you know just kind of roaming and going in different directions and just talking about general ideas so i like the structure what i have here let me real quick um look into that Eoin, what are the top three to four Agile metrics that you track? Um, depends on the team. I usually don't track any metrics unless I'm trying to uh, create visibility around a problem or I want to get, well, basically visibility around the pro problem or I want to show what is going on uh, in relation to a certain area, you know, where I just want to bring attention from the team or the manage management. Velocity is something that we use for planning within teams. This is not a metric that I would ever share with anyone outside of the team, but it is helpful for the team in planning and everything else. It just depends on what you're trying to solve. Uh, Lucien is asking, uh, I find it difficult to get recruiters calling. Any advice? Make sure that when you are writing down, writing your resume, it is very focused on the Scrum master role. I do have a video about that, which is called five Scrum master interview questions. Uh, which one is it? I think it's this one where I talk about the resume. So yeah, I have a couple of questions, a uh, couple of videos on that. Uh, but basically you want to make sure that your resume is focused on the role and you are highlighting the right skills and putting them forward if you don't have the experience, especially, right? Um, and uh, also actually reaching out to recruiters because I don't know how it is where you live, but I know that here in Canada, in Toronto, it's more about networking rather than just sending the resume. So it's more about reaching out to people and um, and trying to find opportunities that way. And advice for your first Scrum Master interview? I have one on Tuesday. So talking about that, uh, that video, five uh, Scrum Master interview questions. Yeah. So watch this one. Um, well, Make sure that you know your stuff, reread the Scrum Guide so you don't have any questions in mind. You're ready to answer questions around Scrum. Uh, think about what the role is, right? To making sure that uh, you understand the role, you can explain what you like about the Scrum Master role, 
um, maybe prepare a good introduction of your of yourself, right? Where say where where they ask, tell me about yourself, and make sure that you make it short and sweet and focused on Scrum Master skills and not just whatever experience you had. Very focused about me speech about communication and do coach new certified scrum masters uh so i do have a mentorship program also that you can find on my website um let me also quickly give you the link here i do have a mentorship program i generally work usually the best um way for me to work with you if you are already in the scrum master role and we work together to help you develop in this role if you don't have right now any experience or no way of actually um, playing the role or getting some of that experience it might be difficult for us but i do have some students in the mentorship program with whom we are working towards understanding the practical things and the practical um, part of the scrum master job so i do have the um, the mentorship program check it out the link is there how is the senior scrum master role different from scrum master you get paid more <laughs> honestly yes that's that's it uh you can watch my video on the scrum master versus agile coach and i think that will explain everything but yeah you just it's it's the same you just work more with stakeholders i guess and more on the high level uh but you still continue to work with the team yeah and you have bigger salary and that is going to be the last one uh the last question that i see here how do we curb scope creep caused by POs who always have urgent priorities even after sprint planning? Well, you need to teach your POs what sprint is, right? Uh, it's more about coming back to that uh, teaching point, making sure they understand that if we planned, you know, for the sprint, we can change scope. That's fine. We cannot change the sprint goal. We can change scope, but here's how we change scope. If you want to put something into the sprint, well, we need to take something out and it's not an optional. Like if you're putting something, you have to tell me which were taken out and then you're kind of holding them accountable to it. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. I went over the, the time that I wanted to, to do the live. Uh, it was a lot of fun, lots of great, questions tough ones as usual i actually still have a list of other questions um, that i wanted to answer so i might kind of jump in on another live later on well this is something that i would like to do on the regular and uh, hopefully that this is something that i would be able to do every month potentially and apart from that well i'll continue creating the videos as usual once a week so we'll have a new topic next week on thursdays i think i'm switching the schedule a little, a little bit so we used to post on wednesdays now i want to switch on to thursdays just to give me a bit more time at the beginning of the week to get ready and to do some research on the topic and yes that's it thank you so much for tuning in when will be next live? Maybe in a month. <laughs> no promises. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks.